Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Robin Archer, and I'm the director of the Ralph Miliband Program here at the London School of Economics. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Christine Sipnovich. I'm especially delighted because I've known Christine for many years, and I've always learned an enormous amount from our discussions together. Um, they go back, dare I say it, to an organisation called Leftists at Lunch, which is not some years ago, but actually a few decades ago. Um, Christine is Professor of Philosophy and Head of Department at Queen's University in Canada, and she's taught at a number of universities before that. She taught at Oxford, at Leeds, in Leiden, in San Diego, and at York. And she's also been a visiting fellow at a number of prestigious inter international uh, institutions at the Australian National University in Canberra, here in England at Corpus Christi College, Oxford. And right now, she's currently a visiting fellow at All Souls College, also at the University of Oxford. Well, Christine's research focuses, I think, broadly on three fields, the philosophy of law, political philosophy more generally, and feminist philosophy. And I think one of the distinctive threads that runs through a lot of, of her work is a serious and careful engagement with socialist and egalitarian claims. In fact, I see that recently she's been asked, commissioned indeed, to write a book called Why It's Okay to Be a Socialist. <laughs> I mean, she's produced a prodigious amount of scholarly work. It's not the place to go through it all, but there's a phenomenal number of scholarly articles and books and a, a large number of monographs and edited volumes. I counted over 60 articles and books on their own. And I mean, if you know how much time it takes to just do one philosophical article, you'll appreciate um, what, a, what an impressive output that is. And all the while, she's also been actively engaged in campaigns in her local community, especially around questions of education and heritage. Well, Christine's latest book is called Equality Renewed, Human Flourishing and the Egalitarian Ideal. And it's the development of some of the arguments in that book that she's going to talk to us about tonight. Christine is going to speak for about 45 or 50 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. Can I just remind you all that in this format that we're in, the way to ask a question is to put it into the Q&A. Um, we won't get to answer all of them, I suspect, but if you could say who you are and if you've got an institutional affiliation, what it is and where you're from, that's very helpful because we have a large audience not just now, but later for the podcast, and it's, it's much appreciated by them. Well, before I hand over to her, can I just ask everyone to join me, vicariously at least, in welcoming our speaker, Professor Kristen Sipnich. Kristen. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin, for the warm introduction and for the invitation to speak to you all. It's a real pleasure and honor to be speaking in this series that honors uh, Ralph Miliband, the towering political thinker who had a formative influence on me as a student of political theory in Canada and here in the UK and whose work I've long admired. Well, equality is an idea that has broad appeal most people claim to endorse the principle that we should be equal before the law at least. And even defenders of the market put their case in terms of equal property rights. Yet we live in a world where the gap between the haves and the have nots is growing. Racism and discrimination are on the rise and even basic democratic and legal rights are in jeopardy. Moreover, today the left faces a sobering philosophical landscape where contemporary Marxism seems to be eclipsed by liberalism in egalitarian thought. Since John Rawls's canonical book, A Theory of Justice, the liberal tradition has set the terms for debate about distributive justice. Whilst Marx's slogan, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs, though stirring, remains just a slogan. Yet recent trends in egalitarian political philosophy have fallen short of defending a far-reaching idea of equality. 
Liberal philosophers' engagement with questions of equality have tended to circumscribe the scope and ambition of the egalitarian ideal in principle and in policy by, for example, rejecting strict equality, attaching conditions to the amelioration of disadvantage, minimizing the material dimensions of inequality, and forswearing an engagement with the constituents of advantage. Furthermore, the dominance of liberalism is such that philosophers on the left too often assume these parameters. Just realizing I should, um, there, that's better. In my talk, I reject these features of liberal egalitarianism and argue that we should embrace a radical political philosophy which focuses on equal human flourishing. I contend that we care about inequality because of its effect on people, and we lose interest in problems of inequality if the putatively unequal are doing equally well in their quality of life. Thus, the answer to the question, equality of what, is flourishing, since whatever policies or principles we adopt, it's flourishing or well-being that we hope will be made more equal as a result of our endeavors. All right, well, let me just give you here an outline of the talk. I'm going to talk about uh, equality generally, egalitarianism without equality, and contrasting that with socialist equality and human need, looking at the deserving poor revisited and the egalitarian perspective among liberals and contrasting that with social class and socialist community, looking at equality materially or immaterially speaking um, and the respect egalitarianism position, um, and then contrasting that with egalitarian flourishing and then concluding. Okay, to start, egalitarianism without equality. It's striking that although their views are dubbed egalitarian, few liberal philosophers actually endorse equality. Joseph Raz famously complained that, that equality is an empty concept, susceptible to justifying leveling down. Leveling down means that widespread poverty is preferred over a society in which there is unequal wealth, even if everyone, including the less advantaged, are better off in the unequal society. The leveling down objection assumes that there will be circumstances where inequality is the only option in order to best address the deprivation of those who suffer disadvantage. And so it's absurd to always prefer strict equality. Accordingly, many contemporary liberal egalitarians do indeed take the view that remedying disadvantage should not necessarily involve the elimination of inequality. Rawls's theory of justice understood equality to be a baseline but his difference principle permitted inequalities if they benefited the worst off. For Rawls, if it turned out that human motivations are such that incentives are required for the talented, then so be it. It may be that we must accede to the demands of the talented person who will only be productive if paid more than the rest of us. Better to have a larger aggregate of resources with which to improve the situation of the worst off, a bigger though unequally divided pie than equality per se. The influence of this skepticism about equality has meant many liberal philosophers have gone so far as to cast a doubt on whether equality has any value even as a prima facie goal. They argue that how a person fares relative to others is irrelevant to distributive justice properly understood. We should only care about whether people have enough or whether severe deprivation is remedied. What the liberal Ronald Dworkin called equal concern and respect for persons has therefore been interpreted by many egalitarians to entail what are called sufficientarian or prioritarian approaches. On these views, treating people as equals means ensuring all people have enough, a sufficiency, or that as Rawls says, priority is given to remedying the position of the worst off. Strict equality, they declare, is the wrong goal for philosophers of justice who seek to remedy disadvantage. Even those who agree that relative shares is important as an ideal, that is how much one person has compared to another, tend to dispense with equality per se. Dworkin's position is a good example. In his theory of equality, 
the appropriate egalitarian distribution will meet the envy test, as he calls it, where no division of resources is an equal division if once the division is complete, any individual would prefer someone else's bundle of resources to their own. Dworkin illustrates this idea with the thought experiment of an auction among the survivors of a shipwreck, where each has an equal initial share of income and decides on the bundle of resources they want by bidding on goods until all markets are cleared. Because this initial equal distribution will be vulnerable to the effect of luck and opportunity, threatening to become unequal over time, individuals will purchase protection in an insurance market. In other words, we will all sign up for the tax-funded redistributive measures of the welfare state. Dworkin insists that although this arrangement will prevent income disparities from being too egregious, their aim is not to equalize income. The, the industrious and creative are properly permitted their chosen pursuits and their corresponding rewards. Dworkin says it would be absurd to exact the very high premiums in, required to insure against, for example, the possibility of not being a movie star. Thus for Dworkin, the minimum income in the society he proposes would be higher than current unemployment or minimum wage levels in Britain and the US, but inequality would persist in some, whereas Rawls presumed equality, but was prepared to depart from it to the benefit of the disadvantaged, Dworkin assumes inequality and aspires to mitigate it to a degree. All in all, the principle of equal distribution as such seems largely abandoned by liberal egalitarians. Okay, let's turn instead then to socialist equality and human needs. And here we should return to Marx. Marx's principle of distribution based on need may seem like a radical pipe dream in our unequal world, but it's worth remembering that the principle is not in fact a call for strict equality in what gets distributed. Dworkin once suggested that sometimes treating people equally is the only way to treat them as equals, but sometimes not. We could say he was echoing Marx's contention that treating everyone the same sometimes only serves to aggravate inequality. As Marx puts it in the critique of the Gotha program, equal shares will mean that given the diversity of human needs, one will in fact receive more than another, one will be richer and so on. So imagine, for example, giving the large rugby player the same diet as their diminutive elderly grandmother, it treats them both the same, but it does leave them unequal in the extent to which they are properly fed. So Marx contended that since human beings differ in their ability to contribute and in what they require to live well, true equality must involve a variegated principle. Now, some might suggest that Marx's reference to need indicates his position is sufficientarian or prioritarian, those schools we encountered among the liberal egalitarian uh, theorists. However, in calling for a nuanced approach to the problem of economic disparities, Marx was nonetheless committed to their full elimination to ensure everyone's needs were equally met. In this, Marx is a thoroughgoing egalitarian where left liberals are not. Socialists understand genuine human community to be a society of equals with no one above me, no one below me. Individuals' contributions are regarded as the assets of the community, the commonwealth, which should rightfully be shared. And we should note in contrast to the lack of moral motivation in liberal concessions to inequality. Rawls, for example, contends that natural inequalities among persons pertaining to their talents and abilities, but even their initiative and capacity for hard work should be understood as the results of what he calls a natural lottery, arbitrary from an ethical point of view, rather than the foundation for meriting unequal property entitlements. That's why he proposes an equal distribution, departures from which could only be allowed if they benefit the worst off. So why should there be any such departures? In his masterly critique of Rawls, the left-wing critic Jerry Cohen points out that it's hard to imagine, given egalitarian premises, that there would be any situation in which departures from equality would be required to assist the less advantaged. Cohen contends that when the high flyers 
insists they'll only be productive if they're allowed to keep a greater share to themselves, they are betraying bad faith with the egalitarian project, running afoul of an interpersonal test or a principle of justificatory community. By this, Cohen means that the rich person cannot justify their greater wealth to those with less. One cannot say, I won't be productive and therefore society will have less to distribute to those of you who are disadvantaged. To articulate such a view is to betray the joint enterprise of building a just society. For Cohen, it may be that our status quo conditions cannot avoid such concession to the selfish motivations of human beings. And we therefore frequently adopt such rules of regulation, as he calls it, that fall short of our ideals. However, a rule that permits compromise in disappointing circumstances in response to the extortion by talented people hardly counts as a principle of justice, as Cohen says. So as Cohen puts it, if you're an egalitarian, how come you're so rich? Now, Marx, of course, was much more optimistic than the liberals about the capacity of socialism to muster enough resources to meet people's needs. This is in part because of some admittedly untenable assumptions about the Earth's abundance, which our heightened environmental consciousness today now rules out. But more tellingly, Marx insisted on a lofty ideal where there would be no trade-off between productivity and equality, and distributive principles would not be at the mercy of people's self-seeking productive decisions. The leveling down objection is therefore misplaced if it assumes that there will always be circumstances where greater productivity requires unequal reward. Incentive arguments betray the egalitarian principle they purport to advance, taking for granted that narrowly selfish monetary interests will always be the principal motivation for human beings. What is termed Marx's communist man suggests that human beings can espouse values of fellowship and regard for others and will care about, or under the right conditions come to care about, producing goods because of the intrinsic interest of the work, its contribution to others' well being, or accept their duty to put their narrow self interest to one side. Rawls does not use the word community. However, his ideas of the well ordered society as a fair system of cooperation, involving public justification, reciprocity, indeed civic friendship and fraternity and a concern for the dignity of, dignity of others all play a similar role. It's been suggested that in this light, solidarity might be added to Rawls's list of the primary goods distributed to individuals as among the things required by justice. This, is, this seems a far cry from the idea with the concession to incentives of people acting altruistically at the ballot box, but selfishly in the marketplace. As Cohen argued, the feminist slogan, the personal is political, reminds us that justice requires that individuals be committed to its ideals in their everyday lives. Okay, the deserving poor revisited and like egalitarianism. The commitment to equality is qualified by, by liberal egalitarians in another sense. Many political philosophers argue that there are cases where a person's deprivation is something for which they should take personal responsibility. Rawls's focus on the worst off was a no strings attached view. However, it was Rawls who noted the arbitrariness of talent and Dworkin further argues that a theory of justice should focus on arbitrariness more precisely. We should not simply remedy disadvantage wherever it might be found, but rather take account of the reasons why it is that some are disadvantaged compared to others. Inequalities that result from the unpredictable vagaries of brute luck are properly the object of egalitarian policy. However, inequalities that are due to what Dworkin calls option luck, that is due to people's choices and gambles, are not owed compensation. As Dworkin puts it, distributive shares should be endowment insensitive, that is in within certain limits, unaffected by people's greater or, less, or lesser talent. It is fair that how much people have is ambition sensitive, greater or lesser depending on their decisions and actions. 
So for Dworkin, we're responsible for our plans, choices, and tastes. It's down to us if we choose to gamble or squander our resources, and society has no obligation to mitigate the disadvantages that may result. We cannot be expected to be protected from failure if we opted for actions that are its cause. On this view, an unequal distribution is just if it is due to considerations for which individuals can be held responsible. A community may offer humanitarian assistance to those whose disadvantages are their own responsibility, but justice does not demand it. With this new focus on responsibility, responsibility what has been dubbed luck egalitarianism soon became the dominant position among egalitarians. Now, surprisingly, this development in liberal egalitarianism garnered the endorsement of thinkers on the Marxist left, such as Jerry Cohen, joined by his analytical Marxist colleague, John Romer. Cohen, who we saw was such a harsh critic of Rawls's concession to incentives, went so far as to salute Dworkin, saying that Dworkin had performed for egalitarianism, quote, the considerable service of incorporating within it the most powerful idea in the arsenal of the anti-egalitarian right, the idea of choice and responsibility. Cohen thus defended an understanding of distributive justice whose axis is the distinction between luck and choice and incorporated this into his own approach. Now as left-wing luck egalitarians, Cohen and Romer stress the significance and extent of brute bad luck for which people are not responsible. Romer elaborated his own luck egalitarian framework that took account of the propensity of disadvantaged social groups to make poor choices in order to mitigate the extent to which individuals could be held reasonably responsible. And Cohen, like Romer, took the view that the arena of luck was a large one, including such things as an affinity for expensive pursuits. For example, playing a sport that involves costly equipment could not properly be considered a matter of mere choice. Moreover, and more seriously perhaps, if we take a global justice view, significant redistribution seems fair given the lack of responsibility peoples in developing countries have for their plight. For all these generous interpretations, however, it remained that luck egalitarianism in one form or another ruled the roost in egalitarian theory. Okay, let's now turn to uh, a contrasting perspective that focuses on social class and socialist community. Well, what are we to make of this focus on responsibility that conjures up odious Victorian notions of the deserving and undeserving poor? Dwarven's hard line on individual responsibility suggests a sink or swim approach that is a harsh alternative to the ideal of full equality. For many progressives, there seems nothing socialist about such a view. There are several considerations here, I think. First, the focus on the merits of the have-nots seems misplaced. What about the undeserving rich, those who are lucky enough to inherit wealth? This is a case of good brute luck, which has no moral justification. And what of the responsibility of the haves whose behavior is exploitative, be it in, in the domestic or global context? And think of the many ways in which governments subsidize capitalist companies. There are corporate welfare bums as identified by a Canadian socialist leader in the 1970s. That attention should be focused on the so-called irresponsible behavior of the poor seems an odd choice of priorities. Second, one cannot assume that the imprudent person is not contributing as best as he or she can. That is, as Marx put it, according to her ability, or as Cohen himself puts it in his portrait of socialism, appropriately to her capacity. If we reflect on the choices we've made in our lives, be they wise or foolish, and the conditions under which we made them, it's difficult to draw a sharp line between what are the result of conscious decisions and what come from factors beyond a person's control. Capacity to choose, something in which some of us are born better endowed than others, is also shaped in part by unchosen circumstances. The influence of parents, friends and mentors, education, locale, and situation. The question of responsibility enters murky waters about free will, determinism, and common sense sociology about class divisions and social capital. 
the culture of the chronically poor, the challenges of initiative and enterprise under straightened circumstances, the crude talent plus effort model of human endeavors looks therefore like an unreasonable portrayal of how a human life goes, whatever weight one gives to the factors in the equation. Rather, personhood seems to be a dynamic process in which nurture and nature, circumstance and choice are mutually constitutive. Indeed, once we entertain a plausible premise about the sociality of the person and the ways in which relations with others constitute our personhood, we can see how freely made choices can be influenced by unchosen social conditions or can have unchosen and sometimes unforeseeable consequences. We can distill the issue as follows. It's one thing to freely choose to do X. It's another to be held responsible for the consequences, particularly if our social conditions incline us freely to choose badly. For some, the path of life is largely how one door opens yet another. For others, having closed one door, subsequent doors are not only closed, but not even discernible. Some doors immediately lock behind and some lead into rooms with no other exit. Rawls's understanding of the natural lottery implies that the ability to make prudent choices, be it the result of nature or nurture, application or fortune, is morally arbitrary, not something which is the basis for entitlement. Given all this, talk of luck versus choice looks of mere polemical value in warding off right-wing challenges to the principle of redistribution. Better just to dispose of the unhelpful apparatus of luck egalitarianism altogether. Finally, socialist community involves relationships of trust, generosity, and fellow feeling, at odds with the grudging attitude suggested by luck egalitarians. After all, despite his critique of capitalist exploitation as a theft of the worker's rightful product, as Cohen acknowledged, Marx ended up severing contribution from distribution in his communist ideal. The justice of luck egalitarianism seems soulless, sacrificing the relationships of community that are usually thought to attend equality. And if we think about the original egalitarian ideal of thinkers like R.H. Tawney, it was of a society whose harmonious relations were such that, as he put it, to divide is not to take away, transcending details of the counting house, rather than one where people make heavily moralized judgments about others' contributions. It seems a sad comment that arguments for equality today hearken less to Marx's communist ideal of a society where all have the means of life regardless of their contributions, and more to Stalin's dictum that those who do not work do not eat. Cohen's own principle of community, which he developed so effectively against Rawls, seems in tension with this picture of the equal society, which picks and chooses which shortfalls in people's resources to mitigate. In his little book on socialism, Cohen offers a delightful example of a socialist camping trip where there is collective property and planned mutual giving. This offers a sharp contrast with what he terms oddly, socialist equality of opportunity, with the upshot that the losing gambler rightly has less than their more prudent fellows. And yet Cohen admits that this ideal of community sits uneasily with the luck egalitarian view. Such a compartmentalized approach where justice and community are in intention seems a poor model for socialism. Indeed, even the most cash-strapped systems of socialized medicine in capitalist democracies do not attach conditions of prudence for the distribution of healthcare where doctors and nurses, for example, might deny cancer treatment to the lifelong smoker or knee surgery to the extreme skier. The philosopher Will Kimlicka makes the useful suggestion that the flaws of what he calls the left liberal marriage on egalitarianism be addressed by norms of equal respect. This entails individuals undertaking an inward application of egalitarian principles, holding themselves to a high standard of socialist behavior but restraint in the other directed application. Thus, though we may be tempted to judge shirkers and seek to alter their behavior, we should resist the temptation to exact a harsh justice. The community is best guided by an egalitarian ethos, another way of thinking of the communist man claim, where people undertake a personal commitment to the egalitarian project, which involves a generous attitude to their fellows and a spirit of reciprocity where all members of the community are committed to doing their part.
as best as they are able. Okay, let's turn to equality materially or, materially or immaterially speaking and look at the respect egalitarianism school among liberal philosophers. Another strain in contemporary liberal political philosophy moves away from the whole enterprise of distributive justice. This came about largely out of disaffection with luck egalitarianism. Elizabeth Anderson, for example, bemoaned luck egalitarianism's harshness, its lack of trust and disrespect shown to disadvantaged persons who, depending whether their lots were the result of factors beyond their control or their own poor choices, could end up either pitied or neglected. She thus proposed an alternative approach that focused on people's social standing rather than their goods or resources. For Anderson, the problem of oppression should be addressed to ensure all can participate as an equal. This requires only that there be an adequate safety net to meet people's basic needs. The just society aims not for material equality, but democratic equality, which pertains to, as she puts it, the relationships among people. Economic position is relevant only insofar as all should have effective access to the social conditions of freedom. In this, respect egalitarianism draws on the difference theme that has been prominent in social theory since the 1990s, which focused on the salience of oppression outside of social class, the relevance of gender and race and cultural recognition. Respect egalitarians and difference theorists share a concern for social relations. For this group of thinkers, the antidote to the unattractive features of luck egalitarianism entails a shift away from issues of distributive justice to reorient egalitarian argument to questions of respect, status, and recognition. Now, these moves are consonant with socialist analysis in many ways. For example, the concern for non-domination among respect egalitarians picks up an important socialist theme about the culture that comes with a society of unequals. As Cole put it a century ago, Poverty is the symptom, slavery is the disease. However, the respect egalitarian strategy ends up displacing the significance of material position and its relevance for human beings. In its instrumental approach to economic questions, the upshot is a minimal restricted form of amelioration, sufficiency rather than equality, with little sense of the importance of a person's material position. The provision of housing, sources of nutrition, health, and so on may be necessary, necessary for taking one's role as citizen, but that's not the reason that people should be provided with them. Material disparities produce a host of cultural and social ills, but it would be misguided to think that such ills are the only reason to care about those, those disparities. Socialists will emphasize material well being not in order to reduce human life to that of what the Canadian political theorist C.B. McPherson called possessive individuals concerned with property and consumption, or as the political philosopher Joe Wolf puts it, modern office, office workers who have salaried jobs and large organizations, which are a burden in proportion to the hours of leisure that need to be sacrificed and a benefit in proportion to the amount of income they yield. Property and income are means to our ends, not ends in themselves, but they matter nonetheless. This brings us to the important question of the place of human well being in our understanding of equality. Okay, egalitarian flourishing. Well being is rarely discussed by liberal egalitarians in the context of their theories of justice. This is because, as liberals, they stress the importance of putting such questions as how people should live beyond the domain of politics, insisting that the community abstain from seeking to influence people's plans of life. According to Rawls, conceptions of the good are susceptible to controversy and should be solely a matter of personal choice. Principles of justice should target the distribution of the means to one's pursuits, opportunities, and income, rather than taking an interest in the pursuits themselves. This argument is amplified in Rawls's case for political liberalism that focuses only on the basic structure of society and abstains from commitments on com comprehensive views about how to live. 
Dworkin's egalitarianism also involves neutrality insofar as treating people as equals extends to a laissez-faire approach to their choices about how to live. Dworkin gives his position an anti-elitist anti -elitist cast. The beer drinking television watching citizen, as he puts it, that citizen's plan of life should not count any less than the plans of life of the intellectual or the aesthete. As he puts it, a liberal theory of equality rules out appeal to the inherent value of one theory of what's good in life. Dworkin goes so far as to favor the market, not typically understood as promoting equality, but commending it for its even-handedness as both liberal and egalitarian in, in its indifference to people's plans of life. Kimlicka picks up on this theme with the idea of the cultural marketplace, where individuals can pursue their projects without the interference of the community. To some extent, one can understand this squeamishness about what's been dubbed by philosophers as a perfectionist creed about the good life. Certainly in the philosophical tradition going back to Plato and Nietzsche, it's thought that the privileged few have exclusive access to living well, which is necessarily beyond the reach of the many. But elitism is not essential to the project of understanding the constituents of a life well lived. The socialist tradition takes a broad view of human well-being, something which capitalist relations of production undermine rather than enable for most people. Socialists understood the elements of advantage and disadvantage to encompass goods and resources, as identified by liberal egalitarians, respect and equal participation, as understood by respect egalitarians, but also non-alienating, fulfilling and valuable pursuits. And living well means living in community, and thus in some sense necessitates a more equal division of the resources needed for human well-being. Marx's critique of inequality embraces the idea of human flourishing in his arguments for the overcoming of alienation and the all-round development of the individual. His case against capitalism centered on its affront to the nobility of man, as he put it, what makes people stupid and one-sided and overturns individualities. His ideal of communism involved creative labor and community, as well as the satisfaction of basic needs. The Victorian socialist William Morris, pictured here, contended a decent life would involve a pleasing environment, be it green spaces, city streets, or people's homes. It was Morris's aesthetic views that prompted him to embrace an egalitarian politics. He accordingly targeted not just unequal income, but also how capitalism meant that where we live gets plainer, grimmer, and barer. Socialism, he said, would provide a beautiful world to live in, which he took to be an elaboration of Marx's egalitarian views. The neutralist orthodoxy of contemporary liberal egalitarianism, which regards human flourishing as a private affair, stands in sharp contrast with the egalitarian tradition that provided the philosophical groundwork for the emergence of the welfare state. The British economist Beveridge insisted that the political community would eliminate not just disparities of wealth, but also problems of what he called idleness and squalor, that is defects in ways of living. Tawny and Lasky also took it for granted that the remedy of inequality would involve a high level of general culture and the conviction that civilization is a common enterprise, which is the concern of all, enabling people to lead a life of dignity and culture. One of the many reasons why luck egalitarianism is such a distortion of the egalitarian ideal is its myopia on the matter of how people come to make the decisions they do. The disadvantage of social class limits the options available to a person who must sacrifice long-term opportunities for the sake of immediate material needs, whose family background renders some opportunities beyond imaginable, who, who is discouraged by teachers who underestimate their abilities. And thus, living well is not simply a matter of choice. People need to be inculcated into valuable pursuits, and inequality means that exposure to what is valuable and worthwhile can be very uneven. Equality in living well also requires a collective response to the way we design our cities, schools, and workplaces. Human well-being pertains to where and how we live, our means of transit, the support we have for raising children, 
whether we have leisure time, our physical and mental health. Recent post-work literature has drawn our attention to Marx's point about how capitalist inequality is accompanied by working conditions that are deleterious for human well-being. People can also fail to flourish because they don't have meaningful relationships with others. Problems of alienation and loneliness are rife in our times, where many lack genuine friendship and love for all the opportunities for Facebook friends, dating apps, and options to sext or hook up. As we become more aware of mental health problems in our communities, issues of depression and anxiety, or how many of us, particularly those on the autism spectrum, struggle with social connections, it seems all the more urgent that our social policies devise ways to make people equal in well-being in a rich substantive sense that enables rewarding relationships with others. No amount of egalitarian social policy, of course, can fully negate the differences in disposition, health, or ability. Some of us cannot help but be Eeyores, as in the Christopher Robin stories, determined to take a glum view on life. Nonetheless, we should be attentive to how inequality and well-being is the result of factors over which society can exert considerable influence. Moreover, an egalitarian flourishing view can tackle the problem of responsibility, not in order to disqualify people from amelioration of their disadvantage, but rather to enable a constructive approach which seeks to assist the more vulnerable so that they can realize an important constituent of human well-being. That is the opportunity to contribute to the community. The flourishing model would take a broad view of what constitutes a contribution. Once we steer away from the allocation of goods and focus instead on the constituents of flourishing, we can give up productivist preoccupations and embrace a broad view of what counts as a worthwhile contribution, be it that of the surgeon or surfer, the intellectually challenged person or the brilliant artist, and the many ways in which persons can engage in creative activity besides in the sphere of work per se. Inspired by Marx's ideals of non-alienated labor, all-round development and socialist community, a flourishing approach to equality suggests a radical answer to a range of egalitarian issues, a robust alternative to the liberal view of political community as playing no role in people's choices about how to live. Okay, just by way of conclusion, in 1958, Iris Murdoch, the philosopher and writer, complained about the paucity of progressive thought in Britain in her essay, The House of Theory, which appeared in a collection of radical political writings. Murdoch, along with contributors Raymond Williams, Brian Abel Smith, and Paul Johnson, among others, lamented the decline of socialist conviction, the loss of energy and vision on the left. She blamed the rise of a managerial laborism that accompanied the success of the welfare state. But also, interestingly, the absence of creative theoretical approaches due to the dominance of a sterile logical analysis in the philosophy of her day. In some ways, Murdoch's lament remains especially relevant. Rawls is often credited with invigorating the discipline of political philosophy after its mid 20th century doldrums that were marked upon by Murdoch. But in doing so, he ushered in an outlook of modest ambitions and imagination. Murdoch said decades ago that there's less poverty, but no more community life, and that work has become less unpleasant without becoming more significant. That is certainly still true today. I've suggested that liberal egalitarianism's contribution to political theory has considerable costs that can be brought up by reflecting on a salutary set of traditional socialist concerns. Of course, it's easy to be pessimistic about the prospects for a radical egalitarian philosophy in the real world. Caught up with apocalyptic anxiety wrought by Putin's post-Soviet pursuit of empire and the persistent battle with COVID, people might seem rather far from contemplating the parameters and prospects for socialist utopia. However, both the war and the pandemic have also forced people around the world to look anew at the inequalities of and among our societies. We're now especially aware of the essential work done in underpaid precarious jobs and how the most vulnerable, particularly the elderly, are inadequately cared for. 
Many on the left are hopeful that principles of social justice will become a priority for public policy long after the health crisis is over. And there was some hope in our heightened sense of obligations to community as captured in the however disingenuous slogan, we're all in this together. The extent of altruistic actions on behalf of the people of Ukraine signals people's conscience about the vulnerability of fellow human beings in far off parts of the world. Our exceptional circumstances are also prompting some soul searching about the constituents of well being and how capitalist societies should be reshaped so we no longer spend so much of our time in cars and planes, so everyone can take walks in nature, spend more time with family, engage in acts of compassion and kindness. The socialist ideal is coming to the fore as we consider the importance of equality and human flourishing and how they're connected. These are times in which the citizens of prosperous societies are, like never before, unequal in wealth, human well-being, and the opportunity to make meaningful contributions to community. Liberal egalitarianism has stepped up to shed some light on those problems. But we should look again at the socialist tradition to remind us of the truly radical implications of the ideal of equality. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the lovely presentation with, I think, William Morris in the background throughout. Um, Should uh, I we, stop sharing now? Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, why don't you? And you can put it back up if you want to. So th there are a number of questions here, but I'm just going to start by asking you one myself, um, which, which takes as its starting point your observation that, that liberalism represented modest ambitions, as you were making clear in your closing remarks. I wonder how you would respond to someone who said that even those modest ambitions had now been replaced by what was essentially a set of concerns that come from a conservative tradition. That is to say, concerns with social order and especially with safety. So you get many progressive people now whose banner is basically safety, which would once have been a concern of the party of order against the radical party of freedom and progress and equality. So uh, this is not so much a philosophical point, but about how the development of ideas has moved and how you see liberalism, if in fact, this observation of mine is the case. So what, by Robin, by safety, do you mean um, uh, law People and want safe spaces and they want to, uh, you know, building on the arguments from respect, they argue for, not feeling threatened by various observations and so on. I mean, this is, this is a very important strand of activism and argument. Doesn't seem to be a liberal in its presumptions, doesn't seem to be socialist in its presumptions. Might it not be that people have fallen back to what's essentially conservative concerns in their philosophical sense, not, not in the party political sense. Yeah, well, I guess safety is a huge concept that under which we could um, place all kinds of preoccupations from, um, yeah, right wing law and order type concerns, uh, right, um, to public health concerns that the pandemic certainly has brought to the fore, um, which, which, and we could say there are egalitarian dimensions to both of those, like some of us are lucky enough to live in safer neighborhoods, safer spaces from a law and order point of view than others. Mm -hmm. um, and ditto public health, um, we became very clear that the inequalities of our society also made for inequalities in the extent to which public health was indeed you know, public. Um, so I think in a sense, inequality and questions of equality and inequality are always there, even if they're not salient. And some of the issue, some of the emphasis on safety is, is salutary. I mean, um, to you know, people who are vulnerable because of their gender, sexual orientation, um, because of their race or ethnicity, um, because of their visible manifestation of their minority religious practices. Um, I mean, I think it was quite quite correct for the the kind of class preoccupied left to be rebuked for not thinking enough about those kinds of issues and they are often issues of just not feeling safe on the street um, and thinking carefully about the kind of phenomenology of, of being a person who feels unsafe in their 
in their in their world, I think is important. So I wouldn't want to just, I think it's important that the left sticks to its guns on the issues that matter, but also be open to um, you know, different ways of what it, of thinking about what it is to be a progressive. Um, I heard an interview with Billy Bragg, and I was so impressed with that guy who I thought, oh, he's bound to just bang on about the things he used to, you know, but he, you know, really receptive to how he, he's an old lefty who could learn about new ways of thinking about what it is to be on the left, and I think that's always important. Great, thanks. And you refer to an earlier speaker in our Miliband series. Um, so I, I, I just want to um, um, comment to the audience, if you've got questions, do, do please remember to say what your name is and, and where you come from and affiliation if you've got it. I have a question here from Thomas Roche, who asks, does the concept of equality not have to do with empathy as a deep rooted human value, that we all depend on each other independently of our status? Even a super rich and powerful person must feel uncomfortable when he when he faces um, a being in poverty or distress. Yeah, so the, role, the role of empathy is the central point. Thank you. That's a, uh, another great question. Um, yeah, I mean, Rawls is famous for having um, come up with a thought experiment where empathy wasn't needed. Um, where we were to think about what kind of society we wanted to, to um, adopt, what, what principles of justice we would um, design um, without knowing who we might be in that society. So um, we, we think about it from behind a veil of ignorance. We don't know our race, our class, um, our talents, et cetera. And we, but we are self-interested. So the, the, this device cleverly gets us to self-interestedly think about what it would be like to be the worst off person. Um, and so we come up with a, you know, principles of justice that make sure the worst off person is okay because we could be that person. Um, and, and I think that thought experiment was applauded for it's the clever way it marshaled self-interest rather than relying on empathy and altruism. Um, but, I, but a lot of critics also said, well, surely in the end, <laughs> there's going to be a burden of commitment when that veil is lifted and we, we do have to feel that connection with our fellow human beings, what Rousseau called a sort of um, a, a compassion that he thought was, we were kind of wired to have. And I, I think it's reasonable to suggest that, yeah, e even the most callous, uh, you know, fortunate person with a, a massive pile of wealth doesn't like stepping over <laughs> impoverished people. <laughs> and I think it's not just because it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. I think, I think we do feel a sense of, of connection with others and we feel distress if they, if they are suffering. Um, and, and so it's true, we need to really harness that. And it, we, there are occasions where, where, it, where it works, right? Where people step up and contribute to people, anonymous strangers on the other side of the world who are, who are suffering. So um, we should be hopeful that we have uh, the resources to act on our egalitarian ideal, uh, egalitarian ideals with with some emotional, um, you know, r r an emotional repertoire that will be helpful. Now, I'm no expert on it, but I, I recall that some social psychologists had evidence that top CEOs of large companies were disproportionately lacking in certain psychological capacities. And if that were so, it would be interesting as to whether, I mean, to what extent do they really care? There's another question here. It's from Ian Benerji, who, who writes from uh, Kolkata in India. Thank you very much, Ian, for clarifying that that's where you write from. Um, and the questioner asks, the bottom 55% of the population owns only 1.3% of global wealth. The top 1% of the world's population owns 43% of global wealth. Is it ever possible to ensure egalitarianism in such a world order today? Yeah, well, uh, luckily I'm a philosopher. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got, I, I, there's nothing about my theory that says uh, inequality is easy to beat or that um, it's just around the corner, this, this sort of ideal egalitarian society that I'm, I'm proposing. Um, so I certainly agree that uh, we're facing a, a world which is very unequal. That's how I, I opened my talk 
by in a sense stressing the urgency of the question. Um, but I think it's still important for philosophers to try to conceptualize what we mean by equality. Uh, and I think if we have a conception of equality that's well thought out, um, which is compelling and per persuasive, there's some hope that, that our political parties will adopt it, that we can have debates in the public sphere about these issues and uh, vote in uh, governments that will move us closer to a more equal world. We're far from it, I, I certainly agree. Thanks. So now there's a question from Anastasia Siapka, a PhD student in Luverne, uh, who asks, theories about human flourishing often encounter the objection that they are utopian or too detached from reality. Have you encountered and how are you dealing with this objection? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a well, there are uh, theories of human flourishing get a pretty bad rap. I mean, most liberal political philosophers are very um, uncomfortable with the idea of thinking about human well being, human flourishing, what's a, what's a life well lived, what's a good life, uh, wanting to relegate that to a matter of just private choice. And I'm trying to stress that, that in fact, the, the socialist tradition right from the start really undertook a, a commitment to enabling people to live well, not just to make sure people had enough property and income and that, they, that those shares were relatively equal, but also to address questions of alienation and community and um, you know, health, leisure, et cetera. Um, from Marx to Morris, as I say, who, who started with those questions and moved to socialism, but also the founding of the welfare state um, thought that one could talk about those issues. Um, one way of stressing uh, its character to make it less um, problematic is that it would be pluralist. It's not like there's one, one way to live uh, and the one sort of unitary conception that the state imposes on us all, but, but rather to um, I, I appreciate that there's a range of, of ways of, of living, many of them incommensurable with each other, you know, football is, 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 a, is a pursuit that shouldn't, is, is valuable just as opera is. So I think one problem is that liberals often refer to the good as though the alternative to the neutralism is a kind of unitary conception, but I think we would have to stress pluralism and, and stress the extent to which egalitarians have for a long time assumed that part and parcel of their project is to think about human flourishing. And we might look upon this sort of liberal um, squeamishness as a kind of unfortunate chapter in the history of egalitarian thought, rather than, I think, you know, we always have a kind of presentist um, um, myopia where we think that uh, our, our current slice of time is, is for all, um, but we might look upon this, this uh, part or this chapter of liberal egalitarian thought as, as uh, an exception and that flourishing actually was the norm in terms of how we thought about equality. Thanks. So now we have a question from Roxana Rusu, um, who's an A-level student. And we're always very pleased to have A-level students in our audience. And the questioner asks, um, the implementation of egalitarian policy has often led countries into unpleasant and counterproductive dictatorships. So what do you think is the flaw that leads these nations towards these dangers of the jaws of communism? And do you think it's possible to tear away Western society from our addiction to a capitalist consumerist way of life? So the, the, the dangers that past history suggests about egalitarian policies and Secondly, can we escape the capitalist water? Perhaps focus Great. on the first one first, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly think that, uh, you know, the parliamentary road to socialism is the road that we need to take. Um, I'm not advocating violent revolution. Uh, um, so that's one. And two, uh, I also think we would have to marry our uh, egalitarian socialist ideas with uh, an emphasis on procedural justice, individual rights, and so forth. And that's something that I've written about in the past. Um, so 
I think the problem has been that there's just been this sort of contempt for those kinds of um, liberal legal institutions. So I think liberal legal institutions um, are important and would have to be part and parcel of this uh, project of making us more equal, you know, rights to freedom of expression, et cetera. Um, that's, that's one. Um, and then a question kind of coming from the other direction, which is how can we sort of liberate ourselves from the temptations of capitalist consumerism or whatever? Um, uh, that's a great question. Capitalism is a protean beast and it's very good at keeping us um, addicted to its, its temptations, that's for sure. Um, yet at the same time, I think the pandemic was rather interesting, wasn't it? Because especially at the very beginning, you might remember we could, it was pretty hard to imagine buying things. I guess people started to use Amazon at some point, but for a while people were taking walks, <laughs> playing board games with their families. There was a sort of sense in which there was tremendous well-being in some, if you were lucky enough not to have an, to not be worrying about income or to um, not be ill. Um, and some people thought, wow, we're finally getting a kind of wake-up call about you know what what life is about how connecting with other people and with green spaces matters. Um, now, uh, of course, the thing about capitalism is it, it's not just an economic system. It's not just an efficient way of allocating goods and resources. It's also a, got a, an apparatus of, of, of seduction. <laughs> and we could, we could tackle that apparatus of seduction in terms of advertising and so forth more than we do um, if, if we had the appetite among our political masters. Yeah. I might just take the opportunity to follow up on the first point of the questioner's question about why things have gone wrong, because you've answered by saying, well, implicitly you've answered by saying, well, it depends on the means of change. If we stick to a parliamentary democratic system, we won't have that problem. But someone might respond to that by saying, well, you know, on your account, there are some activities that are more worthwhile than others. And in order for your account to work, people have to, as you've put it, internalise or inculcate those values to a certain extent. And that then opens up the possibility for a group of people, probably a small minority of an elite of one sort or another, to um, do that inculcating, to create what used to be called a new socialist man. <laughs> so are you not in danger of sort of reinventing the call for a new socialist person. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Robin. Good question. Um, well, I think well, I think we do have to recognize it's not as though we are there, 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 there are two options. No, being totally self-determining, um, you know, denuded of any influences or the state, you know, directing us and telling us what to do. We live in, in we are social beings. We are um, um, shaped by a myriad of influences from benign to more sinister. So, you know, the, the, our, our friends, our parents, our mentors, um, those, those we might say are usually, we hope, benign influences, but also, of course, marketing, advertising strategies, social media, um, you know, uh, the echo chamber of particularly pernicious kind of cultish social media. There's all sorts of ways in which our choices and plans of life are influenced by an environment. So the, the, the project really is to make that environment more accountable, uh, accountable to a democratically elected government, a political community, to, and, and also to be sure that uh, when we think about what is it that contributes to human well-being, we we have in mind a, a variety of, of criteria. So developing our capacities and our potential, marshalling our talents, giving us contentment and mental wellness, allowing us to choose how to live. So there would be a range of, 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 of desiderata about what counts as human well-being and a range of options. So I think if you think about it that way, it's much less sort of sinister than the kind of big brother model that we might fear is, is lurking when you start talking about human flourishing in political terms. Great, thanks very much. So I've got um, a question here from Tabo, a postgraduate student here at the LSE, who refers to Amartya Sen's work and says Sen's capabilities approach seems to also aim for human flourishing. 
Um, as far as I can tell, it is deemed rather a liberal philosophy. What are you thinking about Sen's approach? Is it not comprehensive enough to correspond to your idea of socialist equality? And if so, why is that? It's a very good question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks. It is an excellent question. I and mm. I didn't mention Sen, but Sen is and Nussbaum, the two of them are very influential on on the perspective that I have on this. Um, and so I think the idea of capabilities to uh, and functionings, as they put it, is um, really, really important and valuable. The, the thing that I find disappointing about their approach is they actually are fairly insistent that they are political liberals um, and that they are not perfectionists. They do not think that um, the political community should should play a role in shaping uh, people's um, you know people's choices about how to live and I always found that just sort of curious it didn't make sense to me because given the stress on capabilities which which Nussbaum of course went so far as to start drawing up a list of what they would be it looks to me like that is within this the realm of the kind of thing I'm talking about where what we're calling for is for our political communities to think about equality in terms not just of uh, goods and income and resources, but in you know capabilities of if we want to use Sen's term, which is about how to live well. But interestingly, Nussbaum and, uh, and Nussbaum especially wrote, quite, uh, wrote an essay that was deliberately um, uh, disavowing uh, perfectionist views. So. Um, in a sense, I'm, I'm trying to, if you like, I'm taking issue with them, or maybe I'm more fully um, representing their view or making it more, more consistent. Um, I mean, it's especially surprising given Nussbaum's Aristotelian background and the way she looks at these issues. Um, so, but yes, that's a, a great question. And I, it's something that I tackle because I think their views are so promising in so many ways, and yet it's sort of odd that they side with Rawls um, when it comes to this question about uh, the state being agnostic about the good. Thanks. So the next question comes from Malcolm Bride, um, who's an alumnus from Birkbeck College in the University of London and was a, a student of social and political theory, who asks, the discussion is largely focused on distribution or allocation of resources, but what of the distribution of power in the hierarchical organisations that most people work in? So resources, power, but also work in particular. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think I alluded to that um, um, to some extent because one of the advantages of thinking about equality in terms of flourishing is that you're interested, yes, in distributive questions, but you're also interested in working conditions um, neighborhoods, education, I mean, all the constituents of, uh, of a human life and how it goes well. So um, um, I, I, I agree that uh, there's been a kind of um, goods fetishism, if you like, is an expression that Sen used to talk about roles. Um, and if we talk about capabilities as Sen does or flourishing, we're interested in the many ways in which someone cannot flourish um, and questions of power are important. And so the respect to egalitarian views are useful in that way into re reminding us of the importance of being an equal participant in decisions. And that includes your decisions in your work, work life, as well as decisions in terms of the governance of your community. But I probably should say more about that. Okay, thanks. Um... Uh, though we've had a question from Ayan uh, Banerjee in Kolkata before, I'm just going to put this one up as well because it deals with something different, which is which is I think important. And uh, the question that points out that history teaches us that capitalist competitiveness was created because of three centuries of colonialism and through the loot of nations in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia by European powers. Uh, and it goes on to say that even now uh, European countries are collecting tribute from erstwhile colonial um, countries in Africa. So the question that is asked is, don't you feel that egalitarianism could start by leading European nations to acknowledge this injustice 
rendered the world over centuries and start indemnifying their colonies for change. So this is partly about recognition, but partly about distribution. Well, certainly if we start talking about equality and inequality, a global lens is crucial because we're, you know, the, the most egregious inequalities are global. And of course, you're right, um, there's a history uh, to why that is the case in terms of colonialism and so forth. Um, as a Canadian, I'm, I'm conscious of issues of colonialism within the borders of my own country um, with Canada's treatment of Indigenous peoples in particular um, and the colonial relationship between white settlers and Indigenous peoples. And that involves, in some ways, um, directing egalitarians to look at historical titles, which I think is partly what you're talking about in the global context when you talk about anti-colonial ways of thinking about things. I mean, even just, you know, from a heritage point of view, uh, European museums having loot that belongs to peoples in, on other sides of the world um, and, and ditto uh, um, Indigenous people in Canada and um, how their resources, their land, et cetera, um, was, was unjustly taken by others. Um, so that requires us to think a little bit differently about the past and restoring um, rightful title to peoples whose uh, inequalities today have a have a historical narrative. Um, and I think that, yeah, I agree, that's that's important. I, sh I should say that um, the the questioner um, said this was a great presentation and then went on to ask this. Um, <laughs> indeed, I've left that out of a couple, a couple of them. Um, so let me just ask you a question now um, that builds on the middle of your presentation where you're talking about the deserving poor and especially the sort of Roman two point where you talked about social class and socialist community. And, and you made the point that these luck cases that you were disputing sort of don't sufficiently acknowledge that choice and hence responsibility is constrained by sociological factors of one sort or another. And that seems very, very likely to be the case. And yet it's still the case that in ordinary life, we frequently make use of discussions of responsibility and choice. So in other areas that I know you've thought about, um, judicial cases, for example, it's absolutely central whilst acknowledging that these sociological factors have been important to determine whether someone was or wasn't responsible for a certain act. It's hard to see how a society would avoid making that calculation at some level. So what is the force of the claim that there's this sociological constraint? I mean, is it the radical claim that there's just no space for choice? Is it the epistemological claim that we can't know what role choice played? Or, or is it rather that there's some sort of messy middle where there is still a role for choice? And, and if there is, then what happens to the argument about responsibility? Great, thanks, Robin. That's a, an excellent and tough question. <laughs> I've, I've been taken to task by like egalitarians who say, well, look, we're, we, all these sociological considerations, we're, we're, we're happy to take them on board. We're just talking about this sort of abstract principle that if someone is, you know, can be identified as responsible, and, and there might be a whole slew of cases where they're not, <laughs> then um, they should suffer the burdens of their choices. Um, I start to say that the sociology is so monumental in terms of the, the complexities of that claim that I wonder what the point is of making the lack of egalitarian um, case in the first place. Um, and you're right that in the legal case, we certainly are want to hold people responsible for their crimes, but we, even in the legal case, we do increasingly take stock of the kinds of lives that people have led that cause them to commit crimes. And we're very concerned about the overrepresentation of, in Canada, it's Indigenous people, in America, it's uh, African Americans, um, Britain, it's people of colour too. I mean, that there's a there's a pattern of an unjust unjust social relations which are producing bad choices 
right? Um, so I, I think we, you're right, an individual has to lead a life where they take responsibility for their choices. I mean, that's what every parent teaches their child, uh, their children uh, to live their lives in that way. So I think we, we want to inculcate an ethos of personal responsibility. That would be part of how to live a flourishing life. Um, but I think we have to be much more cautious about having people bear really serious consequences for bad choices um, uh, to, 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 to not um, hold up our distributive apparatus, you know, to hijack it by these considerations. And I think one of the ironies too is that we, we don't in fact um, do that in the real world. I mean, appointed to medicine. I mean, it's not the case when you arrive in the emergency department, you're turned away because you did something foolish to cause your injury or illness. Um, we, we just take need as, as crucial. I mean, and did all the perfectionist thing. And there's another sense in which ordinary public policy is quite happy to make decisions about what, what's, what's worthwhile. We subsidize the arts, don't we? And uh, uh, we don't subsidize, <laughs> Um, you know, uh, uh, bingo, or, 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 or you know, you know what, 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 whatever you want to come up with as a sort of less um, worthwhile way of living, and, and we accept that it's a pretty okay thing for governments to do. Okay, well, we're getting close to the end now. I've got uh, one more question here by Tabo Hunter Gebert, who raises the question of dessert and asks briefly: Do you think there's an intrinsic value to the dessert? Or do you consider the concept of dessert contingent on the organisation of society? And more, more generally, I guess the question is, what is the role of dessert in your thinking? Yes, well, it's interesting um, how this luck egalitarianism seems to be um, resuscitating dessert by thinking that some people, you know, perhaps, you know, hence I used somewhat polemically the expression, the deserving and undeserving poor, but to think that some people deserve the bad consequences of their imprudent choices. But for a long time, um, egalitarian political philosophy and indeed even right-wing political philosophy like Robert Nozick, he never made the case that uh, uh, the state should stay out of people's property acquisitions because people deserve their property. He just said, you know, if, if they, they got their property because of luck, they stumbled upon it, um, you know, uh, they happened to have it handed to them by their rich daddy, whatever it was, it was theirs because it, they had acquired it. It was just a, a, a historical entitlement story. Um, so there is a sense in which I think political philosophy is slightly at, at odds with our everyday discourse where we think of dessert a lot. Um, we think about it in terms of, you know, how, again, how we inculcate values in our children, you know, whether they deserve um, that treat because they were a good boy or girl or or not, et cetera. We, we, it's a pretty commonsensical um, moral device. But I think it's right for us to, you know, look a little bit more critically at it in terms of it being a somewhat worrying basis for really um, significant outcomes. Um, so we want, might say someone deserves the prize for winning a race or deserves um, to win this competition or whatever, but we don't want people to deserve to win in the game of life um, in, a, in a significant way. That, that's too weighty an outcome. Okay. Well, I've just got one last one that I'm going to try and squeeze in, but we'll have to sort of keep it tight. So Anthony, uh, an LSE alumnus, uh, refers to the Chilean economist Manfred Max Neef, who makes a distinction between needs and wants and develops a list of basic needs that everyone needs to survive and flourish and differentiates them from satisfiers that may help them to meet these needs. Questioner asks, does this fit in any way with egalitarian thought along the lines you've sketched it out? Um, well, I think it's true that if you started to work this out with some care, um, you, would, you would probably want to st start with basic needs as your sort of starting, uh, as, as, the, as the first stage in what you're trying to um, ensure society um, provides, the 
the, 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 the resources that people need in order to meet basic needs. And then you would want to um, keep raising the threshold to have a higher and higher understanding of what people, um, what, 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 what equality involves. So I agree that, that that makes sense, but I think we want to make sure that we have a fairly ambitious understanding of needs and we go from you know being housed and nourished to all dimensions of human well-being. But I'm not familiar with that argument, but uh, that, that that's, that's mentioned, but I that sounds useful. And I, I think a sort of threshold approach, as I put it, would be consonant with that kind of um, way of thinking about needs. Listen, thank you very, very much. I mean, you've <laughs> canvassed a phenomenal number of questions, um, some within your sphere of competence and some um, that you've taken on nonetheless. And I think that's uh, characteristic of many of our lectures, and it's very nice uh, uh, that you're able to canvass all of those. I mean, we've heard from our speaker tonight about the sort of um, modesty of aspirations that has overcome egalitarian thought in the course of the latter part of the 20th century. And Professor Sipnovich has argued that that modesty is in many ways mistaken. She set out a series of arguments why the liberal egalitarian tradition in its various forms is inadequate and has argued for a more radical egalitarianism rooted in the socialist tradition in which the answer to what should we be equal with respect to is flourishing. So I think it's been an excellent talk. It's a timely talk, as you pointed out at the end, the times are somewhat different and are somewhat opportune. And I'm very much grateful for you coming and presenting it to us tonight. So it just remains for me to thank on behalf of all our audience tonight, Professor Christine Sipnovich. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Really enjoyed talking to you all. Bye. <laughs>